G'day folks, Bren Carter here, Total Wine Tragic, and you're watching Wine for the People. It's deep dive time, and this time I'm braving one of the most polarizing grape varieties, Sauvignon Blanc. Although a variety that many exclusively drink, there are about as many who ferociously loathe it. The latter is probably likely due to the fact that it's one of the most commercially successful wines in the world. It has an unmistakable aroma and flavor. It's widely planted and cultivated globally from its origins in France all the way to far-reaching New Zealand where it took on a life of its own, effectively putting the Kiwis on the World Venice map and converting millions to the fresh, minimalist white wine that Sauvignon Blanc has become known for. Now, let's get to how this happens. Sauvignon Blanc is another one of those varieties that has, I don't know, a bit of a muddy origin. The prevailing school of wisdom is that it originated in the Loire Valley, being mentioned as far back as the 16th century, as a likely offspring of Sauvignon, and that it's actually siblings to Chenin Blanc and Trousseau. But there is another hypothesis out there that is that it's probably a cross between Chenin Blanc and Sauvignon. So still a bit of conjecture, but what we do know is that it is 100% native to the Loire Valley and the common belief of it being uh, its sort of, I guess, original home in Bordeaux has actually been completely disproven. This is important to note as both the Loire Valley and Bordeaux are known for very reputable expressions of Sauvignon Blanc giving way to the fact that it's not just all cheap swill out there. There are a few styles of note, primarily the most internationally recognized quality Sauvignon Blanc, at least purely for the grape variety, I would argue is Sancerre. Sancerre is pretty much slap bang in the middle of France, far away from the ocean, uh, giving it a, we'll call it a firmly continental climate. And what's particularly exciting about Sancerre is the complexity in the soil. There are three distinct soil profiles around Sancerre, Cayotte, uh, which are shallow soils over limestone. It makes a really brightly aromatic wines for useful drinking. Silec, uh, which are very flint riddled soils producing wines with, funnily enough, flint aromatics. And Terre Blanche, uh, which contain the same limestone and mull that you find in Chablis. You might be familiar with this if you're a bit of a wine nerd as Kimmeridgian soils. And these are the most heralded soils and produce the most structured and age-worthy wines from the entire region. And it's this type of complexity that gives Sancerre its reputation as being a very terroir-driven region. And Sauvignon Blanc as a variety, while often maligned, can actually translate these vast soil differences with crystalline expression. There are also a few other regions in Loire of great repute and worth mentioning, but the, the main one I really want to centre on is Pouilly Fumé, uh, which produces more opulent styles than Sancerre. As we get on to Bordeaux, where things take a turn for the expensive, uh, yes for a white grape variety that is generally in the bargain bins the world over, Bordeaux produces some of the most spectacularly premium examples and I'm talking price point. Of course they're your daily drivers out there but these are some incredible whites, often very ripe, think like 14% alcohol, blended with semillon often and matured in oak for extended periods that command obscene prices, most notably in Pesac Vignon, where some of the most astronomically priced wines actually exist. Think like Chateau Aubryon, which leaps into the thousands of dollars. And the same can actually be said of Pavillon Blanc uh, de Chateau Margaux, where like Bruce Wayne money is required to afford this stuff. And oh yeah, don't forget that Sauvignon Blanc is actually made into the most celebrated sweet wine in the world, uh, Chateau Diquem, uh, and they make a dry white actually at that estate. That's 100% Sauvignon Blanc. So I gotta say, if it's good enough for them, it's probably gonna be good enough for you. Although now is probably the appropriate time that we mention New Zealand, and probably where the source for mixed feelings about Sauvignon Blanc kind of began. It was first planted in Marlborough in 1973, with cuttings brought down from Hawke's Bay uh, by the wine brand Montana, which we now know today as Braincott Estate. And this was well before the region had any meaningfully sort of quality wines uh, that were still in their infancy, working with varieties like Muller Turgau and Chenin Blanc, but a few key events caused sort of a big flip in what they planted there. Firstly, there was a glut of wine with not enough consumption versus the amount that they actually produced. And Phylloxera had made its way to New Zealand, causing many vines to be actually ripped out. And at this time, Sauvignon Blanc was producing relatively high yields, growing in popularity, it was making growers and the winemakers these amount of money. So when the new plantings on Phylloxera resistant rootstocks were considered, Sauvignon Blanc was pretty much at the top of the list. Now into stage left, 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 Cloudy Bay. The story of Cloudy Bay is a pair of New Zealand winemakers visiting Australia in 1983 and popped into Cape Mantell in Margaret River. Met with the winemaker David Honan. Now Cape Mantell is an iconic winery in Margs being set up in the 70s by a trio of families 
the Honans being one of them. So David was already a bit of a legend. Uh, and after starting, you know, I guess one of the uh, only of the third, I think it's the third established winery in the region. When he smelled this bottle of New Zealand Savvy B, he was amazed. And in 1985, he started Cloudy Bay in Marlborough releasing the first ever Cloudy Bay Sauvignon Blanc. Now, since then, it has become the, I guess, the preeminent example of Sauvignon Blanc from Marlborough and commands a pretty decent, like 60 bucks a bottle. It then was imitated, I guess, by hundreds and hundreds, and it's comfortably the number one planting in New Zealand at a whopping 15,700 hectares. And that's just in Marlborough alone. Consider Pinot Noir, New Zealand's second most planted variety only has 5,000 hectares and that's for the entire country. Now the world has lapped up this style, so much so that in the top 20 sold individual wines across the planet, there are four Marlborough Sauvignon Blancs. The highest ranking is actually Kim Crawford, followed by the legendary Oyster Bay. This is generally where we help you guys with how to identify Sauvignon Blanc in a blind tasting. And look, to be honest, with your run of the mill Sauvignon Blanc pretty much anywhere, uh, you're probably gonna be easily be able to pick up on what it smells like. And the best description I've actually found comes from the respected MW and journalist, Bob Campbell. He notes that it's like taking a, a bungee jump into a gooseberry bush. Now, being polite, I'd actually call it passion fruit. And if I'm not, I'd call it asparagus and cat's piss. It's searingly high in acidity with light body and texture with pretty restrained alcohols, unless it's from Bordeaux, of course. Uh, Sancerre is, I guess, where it starts to get a little bit tricky because these wines tend to be quite elegant. And passion fruit and citrus are still going to be some of your key aromas, but if you're getting great mineral and flinty hints, maybe a bit of oak, you're most likely going to be in the Loire. If you're game enough to swallow that pride and re-ride the Savalanche, there are a few that you can wrap your lips around that we recommend, and we've tested them too. For a bit more of an entry level, try Dog Point from Marbra. And don't worry. It's not what you think it is. Really good example, and I'll set you back probably a modest 30 bucks. How about some Bordeaux Blanc? No, we're not gonna go too crazy on price. There are some decent value buys out there. Try the Chateau de Steron Blanc. Mostly Sav, a little bit of Semillon, but bloody good for a very modest $45 redos. And for your benchmark Sancerre, Francois Cotat. Uh, he's the real deal, Cuvée Paul, it's his top Cuvée. It's named after his father and pretty spectacularly farmed. It's like very minimal handling, very little sulfuring, can be the absolute apex from the region. Very, very amazing Sauvignon Blanc. Anyway, folks, thanks for hanging around. If you have, prove it to me with a comment below. What's your viewer Sauvignon Blanc? What's the last one you had? And who did you share it with? If you like what we do, give us a thumbs up. If you love it, be sure to subscribe. And until next week, we'll be slaving away on more of these for y'all.